All right, going to give folks just another few seconds to find a seat. It is so good to see like people in like 3D. It's it's amazing. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to PNCWA, our annual conference for 2022. Um, it is amazing to be with you here today. Uh, we've got several dozen with us um, who are seeing us via virtual live stream. So it's great to be seen as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Lee. I have been tremendously honored to serve as the president of the board of directors uh, for PNCWA this past year. What a year. Right, um, it's it's great to be back in person, but I know that we've been living through a lot of challenges this past year. Uh, globally, if you look outside, locally, one of the amazing things about being back in person is the chance to connect with one another, and that's what makes this conference so great. But in those connections, I've actually heard just in the the short time I've been here of a lot of real challenges personally that folks have had this past year. Um, I personally have lost a, a family member, and we weren't actually even able to get out to the funeral in Korea because of the COVID restrictions out there, and they're so much stricter than, than out here. And, and yet I, I see that the fact that we're all here together just shows how resilient we all are as an industry, as communities, and as individuals. Uh, my parents were immigrants to this country. Uh, they came in the late 1960s uh, when there weren't very many people like them here. Uh, they came at tremendous risk and sacrifice, but they came here because they had hope uh, and what a life in this country could bring. And almost 55 years later, I think they still have a tremendous appreciation for this country and what a life here means. Um, growing up as a child of immigrants, I've learned to see the world through their eyes. Um, so even though I was born here, I think even in the face of all these challenges, I have such hope for what the future may bring. For me, this conference always represents hope. Um, it's a hope for a better future. That's why we're all here. Uh, a future for ourselves as individuals, as we connect and network, but also a, a, a hope for what we can do to make the world a better place. And so as we kick off this conference, I wanted to acknowledge a few names, just a few. There are so many people who made this conference possible. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge a few of the names uh, who have helped uh, put this conference together. So we've got a few slides, hopefully they show up. Uh, the first, I just wanted to highlight Vicki Hollingsworth, and I'm going to ask, there's a lot of names I'm going to show up, so I'm going to ask folks to like hold the applause till the end, but uh, Vicki Hollingsworth, our conference chair, and Jeff Schmidt, our technical program chair, uh, you'll get a chance to hear them later in this session, so that's wonderful. Our amazing board of directors, uh, put in so many hours this past year to to help steer the organization to where we are today. Uh, sponsors, uh, this conference isn't possible without the sponsors of the conference and the association, but uh, in particular, the sponsors of the opening general session. Uh, we wanted to highlight uh, all of these firms who have given so generously to, to make this conference possible. Uh, our exhibitors, uh, we've got over 100 exhibitors who have come in at great sacrifice to bring in equipment, uh, show us the latest and greatest technologies. Um, so there's a lot going on, really encourage. There's so much learning that happens just by walking around that exhibit floor. So thank you exhibitors for being here. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, one group of individuals to stand. We have our uh, second inaugural, no second, it's not inaugural, just our second inflow class. Inflow stands for Introducing Future Leaders for Opportunities in Water. Uh, it's a program that uh, has been spurred on to really bring uh, the next crop of the, the hope for the future into our industry. So we've got six people who have been able to come out to the conference. These young folks are really what the future holds. So inflow class, I'd like you to, to stand. If you folks see these people around the conference. Yeah, if you see them around the conference, go up to them, say hello. You, all of us were once a brand new attendee and a young person. We still are young, but we were their age. And, and go introduce yourself, welcome them. Yeah, walk around the exhibit hall with them. Um, do something to, to just make them feel welcome. We have over 800 folks attending this conference uh, here, and that's amazing. Um, it's a testimony to, to, again, the power of what we can do together. Um, I did want to introduce two last individuals. Uh, first, 
for folks who don't know, the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association is a member association of the Water Environment Federation, or WEF. Um, so we're pleased to have with us at the conference, Amy Colleen. She is the vice president of the board of trustees. Uh, she is going to be more active in the conference. So there's lots of opportunities to hear from Amy, but Amy, I'd like to go ahead and stand and be recognized. Thank you for being with us from Louisiana. Uh, it's great to have you here. And then last person I wanted to introduce during my time up here is uh, Marie Schmidt. So Marie, if you wouldn't mind joining me up here. Marie's our new managing director. Uh, PNCWA has been without staff for the last few years. And so after not one, but two searches, we were waiting for Marie to come join us. Uh, Marie comes as part of an organization called uh, Association Management Inc. So we actually have a lot of resources through that organization, but Marie will actually be uh, handling most of the operations for PNCWA. And so we wanted to give Marie a chance to meet all of the members, all of you here today, and give her a chance just to say some few short remarks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna be just very, very brief. So um, I live here in Spokane. I'm originally from Idaho. My background is in water resources and specifically aquatic ecology. I've worked the last 10 years in water outreach and education, and now I'm part of AMI, um, which as Rob said, is a third party association management group that manages almost 50 associations, just like PNCWA and I will be your full-time PNCWA staff. I'm brand new. I just started uh, just over a month ago. So I'm still very much learning about PNCWA. I'm really excited to meet you, learn about all the different things that are happening with PNCWA because there's a lot um, and just hear your stories. So thank you. So please call Marie first if you have any questions. All right, uh, so lastly, um, we're really, really proud of, of where the association is going. And one of the things we realize is the need for partnerships, that we are not the only organization to do uh, education and networking around water. So this is the second year where we've had this opportunity to partner uh, with Water Reuse. Uh, Water Reuse is a, a like-minded organization uh, and they have a chapter here in the Pacific Northwest. And so would you please welcome uh, with me, Holly Tishner, who is serving as the vice president of the board for Water Reuse Pacific Northwest. Thank you, have a great conference. Thanks Rob. So I'm really happy to be here this morning to speak on behalf of the Water Reuse Association members, as well as Matt Troll, who is the president of Water Reuse. He will be here at the conference. He's just uh, coming here later today. This is a perfect time for us to look at collaboration around water resiliency. So this is exciting for PNWA as well as Water Reuse to partner in this program. Now, why is now the time to bring this forward? Uh, as we all know, we're facing climate impacts. Water reuse and recycled water solutions help us to mitigate climate change. It helps us to provide more economic uh, benefits for our public, our communities, our businesses. It supports water re resiliency solutions in a new way. It provides a component in our water management solutions that we really need uh, for the future. It also protects our environment and it allows us to support ESJ. Uh, commitments. So this is an incredible time. The Water Reuse Association Pacific Northwest represents Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. We're supported by a national organization. So if you're not familiar with the national organization, it's been around uh, for a couple of decades. It might be three decades. Um, it supports, it has members in 38 states, the District of Columbia, and 11 countries. So it's a powerful organization. We really focus on policies, laws, funding, as well as education and public support, um, education as well as of, uh, of our leaders, including uh, this group here today, as well as our elected officials. So by 2027, in five years, the use of water reuse will increase by 37% across the country. And that equates to 6.6 .6 billion gallons a day of recycled water. 
this is, this is our time um, to bring reuse forward as a solution. As you might know though, the Pacific Northwest is barely at its infancy in terms of use of, of water reuse. Uh, one of the things that we can highlight is in our, in our um, state of Idaho within the Pacific Northwest, um, they've blazed the trail in recycled water solutions and 92% of their recycled water is used for irrigation of crops. That means 2,000 tons of nitrogen are kept from our rivers and streams, as well as 500 tons of phosphorus. This is exciting times. And, and really, because we're at the infancy, it's very important that we all take time to really learn what does the water reuse mean within our communities? It's not a one size fits all in each community. And we asked 30 leaders within the Pacific Northwest, public agencies, as well as private, what are the barriers to implementation? What they said is we can create better pathways for regulations. We can make that more efficient and affordable. We can create pathways that allow this to be feasible within our communities, both our large communities as well as our small communities. We can create state frameworks. So what we're looking at is in some cases, we do have a state framework that supports reuse and water resiliency. In many cases though, you'll find that those policies and rules are in multiple different locations within different plans, and they're not passed along, it's not cohesive. So we do need comprehensive water resiliency state frameworks. We also need to know what funding is already available. I believe we're missing out on funding opportunities. Uh, so we need to bring those forward as well as increase those funding opportunities. And then last, but of course not least, we need to increase the awareness that recycled water is a safe solution when done right, used right, which we have all faith in our technology to, to be able to do that. It is a solution that we really need in our portfolios to have real robust innovation in water management. So our team of Water Reuse Association volunteers who are here, they are energized. There is a, quite a, a group that is, I think, doing the work, 10, maybe doing the work of 50. We need more people participating in the organization. And you have a chance to learn more from that team. Uh, tomorrow we have sessions uh, all day and Matt Schroll will be um, speaking in the morning with Greg Fogel. He's from our National Water Reuse Association. He's our government affairs director. We will also have showcase presentations from each state. So every state is represented in the presentations tomorrow. And then there is a regulator session. So if you really want to dive in um, into some of those barriers and challenges and how do we partner with our regulators, we'll have uh, representatives from each of the Pacific Northwest states, as well as Nevada and New Mexico. And then, of course, we have a fun event this evening. If you were participating last year, I, you might remember the uh, dunking booth. Uh, we took it down a notch this year. Uh, today, we have a uh, a rubber ducky race. So if you want to blow off some steam and, and then get competitive and you're not into Monday night football, uh, the rubber ducky race is, is for you. So we look forward to answering your questions. We have a booth um, in the exhibit hall and uh, find us and we'll talk more about water reuse and what we can do together. Thank you. I'm now going to turn this over to Vicki, our conference chair. Hi, everyone. Um, can I just take one second to just take all of this in from this vantage point because it's, it's really something. Like Rob said, we have over 800 people in attendance this year, including those of you joining us virtually. And that is really getting us to pre-COVID numbers and it's amazing. And it speaks to the resiliency of this organization for sure. And we also wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the incredible leadership of our previous conference chairs and presidents. So I wanna take a moment to acknowledge them. I think starting with the incredible adaptability shown by Brittany Birch and Ali Odd in 2020, when they pivoted to deliver conference in a completely virtual format. And then the thoughtful and purposeful leadership of Haley Falconer, Emily Amaro, and Ali Hornack, who in 2021 
you guys innovated in so many ways and truly uh, were able to give us our first hybrid conference in 87 years. So that was fantastic. You guys handle change and really challenges with such agility and such grace that I was really, really, truly inspired. So when Rob invited me to be conference chair this year, I jumped right in. Also because during the worst of the pandemic, I leaned more into PNCWA to find community and to find connection. And I just wanted to give back. So I, I remember that we came to our first planning trip here. We were sitting at the Onion and we were listing out what do we want the goals and our aspirations for PNCWA 2022 to be? And we were drawn to uh, Bruce Lee's quote, say this, be like water. And our theme this year is be like water, adapting with purpose. And that's, this is a reminder that we need to take life as it comes and that we not only need to accept change, but we need to embrace it because change is progress, change is evolution. And um, just like water, we need to be able to move around our obstacles and adapt to our surroundings without losing sight of our final destination, our ultimate destination, right? And for us, it was really clear, like our ultimate destination really was simple. It was to learn together, to build connections and, and just have fun. So before I get to some announcements, I do wanna take a moment to thank our amazing conference planning committee this year. Thank you so much for all the energy and the sacrifice that it has taken to plan some of the events that we've already enjoyed yesterday and the ones that we'll continue to enjoy over the next three days. All right, and now we can get to some of the key announcements, starting with health and safety. As you can see, we're lucky that this year we get to get together with less restrictions than last year but we have continued to uh, consult with a health and safety advisor and we're following the strictest guidelines uh, of the region. So what does that mean for us is, one, if you start to experience any COVID symptoms, let's err on the side of safety and not assume that is you know, allergies or cold, and please cut your uh, conference short. We also encourage and welcome masks so if you feel more comfortable wearing a mask, we have some masks available at the registration table. And then it really boils down to let's respect each other's social distance comfort levels. So we're bringing back one of the innovations from last year, which is the bracelets that indicate your preference as far as social distancing. So it goes from red, please keep uh, your distance, to green, I'm okay with handshakes. And for those of you joining us in person, we have some amazing events coming your way, starting with the beloved Ops Challenge is back this year. And huge, huge thanks to Chris Nicholas because really he made this a reality. And I also wanna thank our uh, participating teams this year, the city of Ben and the city of Coeur d'Alene. They're gonna show us how it's done right outside in the main lobby a few minutes after the session is over. I'm sure you did not miss this setup. We also have another beloved event, the Women's Networking Reception, and that's happening also today, starting at 4.30. And this is a great opportunity to network with women in water and to just have a lot of fun. All women are welcome to attend. Like Rob said, um, we have our exhibit hall opening reception tonight to starting at around 510 going to seven. Let's show up and show you know our support to our manufacturers and representatives that always are supporting our development, are supporting our projects and are supporting our association. So make sure that you stop by. And we're gonna end the night with a bang. Another one of the innovations from last year that we're bringing back is the Monday night networking event. This was a huge success last year because it makes networking and, and, and meeting new people really more accessible and equitable to everyone attending conference. And there's gonna be a lot of fun 
We're going to have football. The Seahawks and the Broncos are playing tonight. We paid really good money for that. We also are going to have some tailgate style games and we're going to have tailgate style foods. So make sure that you stop by. It's in the roof deck. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I also want to take another moment <laughs> to recognize um, our inflow class of 2022 and make sure that you stop by tomorrow. Tomorrow is a day of celebration and a day of recognition. So our inflow class of 2022 tomorrow, starting at 430, is go they're gonna be sharing what they learn throughout the year. Uh, and they're gonna be um, giving us some presentations and actually some key takeaways for us to have from their perspectives. So make sure you stop by. And then finally, we're also gonna be recognizing some exemplary people and exemplary projects during the awards banquet. So if you're attending that, that starts at 6.30. Uh, make sure that uh, we'll see you there. And you don't have to keep copious notes of everything I just said. Really the best way to know um, you know, what's happening and where is to download the PNCLUI UI app. You can download it from iTunes store or you or Google Play, and it'll keep you um, up to the minute on any revisions and changes. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to my partner this year and uh, your technical program chair, really the guy that had the most the most difficult job and made it look easy, Jeff Schmidt. All right. Good morning, PNCWA. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here and for having us here. Uh, it's a, it's an honor to be part of this. Um, so, um, as Vicky said, we we have a we have a really excellent technical uh, program this year planned for you all. Uh, we're back to having eight full tracks of content. So, whatever your specialty area is, you should be able to find something to go uh, to go listen to. A lot of really great speakers. So. I uh, would encourage you all to take advantage um, of those technical sessions, um, take advantage of the tours, um, just a lot of good stuff to check out um, as we go through the next three days. Um, some logistical things for your um, technical program. So for CEUs and PDHs, you should be able to pick up at the registration desk um, a sheet that you can get stamped. So make sure you grab that and hand it to the room monitors at the back of the room and they'll stamp it for you to give you credit. Um, for this opening session, um, there's a spot in the upper left where you can put your initials and the secret keyword for this meeting. Now, here's the thing. We're telling you guys now before the rest of the presentation. So you got to stick around if you're going to claim credit, all right? We're going to watch if you leave in the back and call you out. All right. So the, the keyword for this session is the word adapt. So that keyword is adapt. And put that in the um, upper left, and you can get credit for attending today. Uh, to our virtual live stream attendees, thank you for being here. Really um, glad to have the virtual attendees listening in this morning. Uh, just so you know, when you're doing virtual sessions, um, there'll be a chance a question gets asked and you can answer that question. That is how we track who is in attendance. So make sure you answer those questions as a virtual attendee. And for um, just for everyone's reference, uh, tracks one, two, and three are all being live streamed to the virtual attendees this year. Um, if you are here in person and you want to watch that content afterwards, all those sessions are recorded and you can add on to your, uh, to your current package to get those recordings afterwards if you just want to relive PNCWA and learn about some more things after the fact. All right, um, <clears throat> let's see. So um, site tours. So we have four great site tours planned for the conference. Um, really excited about that. A chance to get out into the area and see some things. These are first come, first served, so um, show up and, and um, take part. Um, the details about where to meet and what the tours are are on the app. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, sessions today, tomorrow, and Wednesday for the tours, and they've all been approved for CEUs, so you get credit for going on those as well. And uh, thanks to Hannah, Hannah Thomas Call for her help on really organizing those and getting uh, folks to sign up to, to lead tours. Uh, the exhibit hall, um, so exhibit hall, we're, we're really trying to, again, increase that connectivity between attendees and the exhibit hall. And so once again this year, we're offering some exhibit hall tours. These will be on Tuesday. So there'll be three tours in the morning. Tours are broken up by discipline. So you can go to the ones that are of interest to you. Um, so at 930, there's stormwater management, solids management, collection systems. And then tomorrow afternoon is pumping systems, treatment solutions, and emerging technologies. 
we will have a guide to lead you through and, and take you to th through several of the vendors who will then talk to you about their technologies and what they have to offer in that, in that space. So please take advantage of those. And um, thank you for Nicole Kaiser who organized that and the Emerging Technologies Group. We appreciate their committee's efforts. Um, and those are also approved for CEU credit. So that's great. Um, and then post-conference workshops, uh, those are gonna be held uh, this year on Wednesday after the conference. So starting at noon, lunch is provided for those who are taking part in the workshops. Uh, they're four hours. Um, if you've not signed up, I think you can still sign up at the registration desk. And um, thanks to Eric Roundy for coordinating that and getting out to the, the workshop uh, presenters and making that happen. So really appreciate his efforts. And so with that, I think um, the last thing we just wanted to do is sort of give a thanks to everybody here. You know, this, this conference is only successful because of all of you that attend and all of you that present and send in abstracts and take part. And so just wanted to give a shout out to everybody. And I, I thought what would be interesting to do would um, be to sort of get a sense of who here is involved in the conference for the next couple of days. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a few people to stand and just remain standing. So if you are presenting a paper, could you please stand? Just trying to give a sense of how many people here are, are, are necessary to make this work. And then if you are leading a tour or you're leading a workshop, could you please stand up and stay standing? Speakers, stay standing. Stay up. Okay. And then um, if you're volunteering to be a moderator at one of the sessions, could you please stand up? Stay standing. We're adding to this. If you reviewed an abstract, can you please stand up? If you were involved with planning any of the events that occurred yesterday or are about to occur in the next three days, can you please stand up? Hey, if you're on the board of directors, could I ask you to stand and remain standing, please? If you're a committee chair. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to stand as well. And then if you served at all on any committee for PNCWA this past year, would you please stand? Hey, okay, hold on. I got to take a photo of this, like, and wide, wide lens. That's amazing. Um, can we just give all these folks a round of applause? All right, everyone. It is my great honor and pleasure today to introduce you to our keynote speaker for this year, Phyllis Brunner. And Phyllis is one of us, a clean water professional. And in her over 45 year career, Phyllis has held titles as Senior Vice President, Operations Manager, has been responsible for business performance, growth, sales strategy, also delivering projects. And Phyllis worked for Brunner Global for over 20 years. And that's when I first met Phyllis. And I just grew a deep appreciation and respect for Phyllis because she would often often go out of her way to make me feel included in the company and in the industry. Phyllis is currently the president of the Indian Island Association based in Casco Bay, Maine. And in her role, she collaborates with governmental agencies, local community leaders, and nonprofit organizations to bring and develop solutions that are aimed at helping protect coastal communities for years to come. So please join me in welcoming to the stage our PNCWA 2022 keynote speaker, Phyllis Brunner. Oh, thank you, Vicki. Wow, 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 wow. I gotta take this in too. Wonderful. Um, what a privilege it is for me to be speaking to you today. As I look out, there are so many friends, colleagues, clients, people that I've worked with over my career. It's really wonderful to see all of you in person. Thank you so much for having me. My talk today uh, aligns with the theme of the conference, Be Like Water, Adapting with Purpose. And what I hope this is is a call for action to you and to all of us. Uh, we are facing many challenges in the water industry today, but I am uh, very encouraged because we have faced them before. I would like to reflect on the learnings uh, 
uh, from the profession and how we've developed over time. I'm confident that we can move forward with hope and optimism. I heard those words from Rob and I really appreciate it. I'm a very optimistic person and I'm going to tell you some optimistic stories. I'm here to share with you my perspectives on our water business, how we'll approach our challenges more sustainably and some suggestions from me on how to do that and how to stay engaged over a very long career, your own resiliency. And I've got a challenge for the new folks here at the end. I have been associated with PNCWA since 1985. My husband came up to, uh, Dave and I came up to go to graduate school at the University of Washington in Seattle. We had um, both uh, gone to school in Colorado and Boulder, and we loved the mountains. For those of you that know me, you know that I also have deep roots in the coast of Maine. My mother has a property there that uh, I've inherited. Uh, I have a cottage um, that's been, uh, the land has been in our family since 1884. So I have very deep roots on the coastline. So Seattle was a wonderful place for Dave and I to come to with mountains and the coastline. Dave and I have very much enjoyed our time in the Northwest and it's been an interesting 40 years. There have been lots of changes. We enjoy the beautiful region and it has such a national spotlight because of the quality of life uh, and because of the business opportunities. Um, it's been interesting to live and to work in this place and see the changes over the last four decades. Some of them have been positive and some of them uh, have been negative. Um, these changes are a microcosm of what's going on in the environment globally, and uh, we need to rise up to those professionally. It offers opportunity and challenge to us. These are changes that are brought on by population growth, regulatory framework that provide professional opportunity and great work for us, all of us in this room. But I have concerns about the state of the region and where the world is at this point. I have one daughter, Blair, and she is at uh, Tufts in vet school. She's 26. And I wonder what kind of world will she see out on the horizon? So my goal today is to instill a sense of urgency in tackling the challenges that we're facing, but also with hope and confidence that we can creatively solve these issues that face us to benefit society and the environment. As a conference gets underway and over the next few days, I really hope that you as environmental professionals will come away with a renewed sense of purpose to drive the world sustainably forward for the future generations. As water professionals, there's so much opportunity, but also with that comes responsibility. So I've been working as a geologist and engineer for over 45 years, and it is amazing to me. I feel like our time has finally come. And I say that because the spotlight is really bright on infrastructure. The new bills that have been passed, the $1.2 trillion bill, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the recent Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, both um, that came into law in August and the uh, infrastructure earlier this year, uh, will really uh, ramp up the investment in technology and bring private industry back to the United States. There's a recognition that we need to fix neglected infrastructure and address, and address the challenges we are experiencing in our overstressed environment. These problems and us are no longer in the background. We, they, we are not out of sight and neither are those issues. It's exciting and there's so much momentum to build on. There's advantages and um, there's advances that industry has made and we're gonna build upon those. I wanted to start off and look at historically what we've done and then build upon that uh, expertise. Expectations are high and our skills and our experience is very much needed. At the same time, our reality today is dynamic, it's complex, it's messy, and it's uncertain. One of the biggest threats, we several of our speakers have already talked about it, is climate change. Thankfully, I think the debate has finally changed where it seems to be more about uh, what are we planning for and what the magnitude of these changes are going to be? When we think of climate change, we often think of greenhouse gas emissions, but many of us in this room and most of us are associated with the water side. Um, it's either too much, too little of it, 
or on the water quality side, which is very important. Water always adapts and finds a path, sometimes a pot of positive one, fulfilling a, filling a reservoir or providing a healthy habitat for fish and wildlife and nourishing our gardens. Sometimes it's a negative one, uh, leading to local and major drainage wave flooding, breach dams, erosion, and droughts. And in some respects, it's a combination. In 2021, here in the Northwest, we had one of the driest summers on record. And then a few months later in November, we had historic rainfall. So how we saw horrific forest fires, we saw environmental destruction from the dry conditions and incredible damage with, uh, because of the floods that were uh, months later. So how can we plan and design and build solutions for communities with so much in flux and feel confident that we're delivering the best answers for the generations that follow us? How can we move into a future in a positive way, building on the lessons of the past without getting mired down in them? Innovating, adapting, and preparing to address obstacles that we're not really aware of or we're not really sure of yet. These are the challenges we face in our professional lives today. So let's talk about it. We have always uh, faced some uncertainty and, and we've made great changes in our industry. Look at how wastewater treatment has changed in the past 100 years from dumping raw sewage into, wa into waterways and then implementing high levels of nutrient removal today. I remember barging garbage when that was happening off the coast of New Jersey, that's where I grew up, and seeing it wash up to our horror on the beaches of Jersey. Here in the Northwest, in the 1950s, wastewater flowed into Lake Washington and Puget Sound and in many of the rivers and smaller lakes with very little treatment, resulting in serious water quality issues throughout the region. In 1958, voters created Metro and developed a regional wastewater treatment system based on watershed and not political boundaries. Two of the regional plants, the South Plant in Renton, the Magnolia, uh, or the um, West Point Plant in Magnolia, uh, were up and running in 1966, resulting in dramatic improvements in water quality. In 1994, King County assumed authority for Metro and treating wastewater for 34 jurisdictions in the Puget Sound area. The Metro Seattle Sewage and Drainage Survey that was done, it was a plan that was done in March of 1958, set the course for all of this development and implementation and construction that occurred over all those years. And many of us in this room today attending have worked on that plan and implementation in our careers. Look at the advances we've made in regulations and compliance. Regulations have changed over the years. We've adapted to those evolving regulations. They've, ad they've driven advances in water, wastewater management, and a willingness to use natural resources differently. Regulations have opened the door to the use of reclaimed water. They have increased our understanding of the role that stormwater plays and how to manage it. We've developed more sophisticated operations approaches. There are more regulations around water quality that set the bar for discharge and end users. There's a whole new world around resource recovery and all kinds of waste that have necessitated regulations to create valuable products for society to safely end use. We now practice better monitoring and we hold industry and municipalities more accountable for compliance with those regulations. Regulations have been the driver in the water industry along with growth for so many years. Regulations for better or for worse are part of the picture for all of us professionally. Regulations are a necessary cost of business, but significantly lower costs in the, than the irreversible environmental damage uh, to life systems on this planet. Think about technology and how it's changed. This is a really big one. My grandfather was the town engineer in Persephone, New Jersey, where I grew up, which is 45 minutes west of New York City. At the time, I did not appreciate the technology or the lack of uh, that he used to run our growing suburban community in the late 1940s up to the 70s. The water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste equipment, the systems and processes that he worked with 
during those years was appropriate for the times, but oh, how it has changed in 70 years. My dad was a land surveyor in our hometown in private practice, and his tools brought transit, a plumb bob, and a steel tape to do surveys of subdivision uh, lots and lay out roads and utilities for large housing developments that were built on farmland after World War II. He would sit up at night, uh, breaking down the survey notes from that day and getting the next topo grid set up for the crew the following day. He also did a layout for, and he did a lot of work for the big power transmission lines that were built across miles of open country in rural North Jersey during the 60s. His work was low tech, labor intensive, and time consuming, but very impactful building modern infrastructure for post-World War II growth in the New York suburbs. They would both be amazed at the information available today using GIS databases, seeing the world on Google Earth, the information and data available over the internet by asking Alexa or Siri for search engines. They would be excited to use travel direction and map apps and be impressed with the ease and accuracy of today's survey equipment and data compilation programs. Very much streamlining the process that my dad would do in the basement with his old Olivetti calculating machine. I can imagine they would both marvel at the use of drones and the accuracy and the efficiency of the final products. My grandfather would be in awe that a town engineer in Persephone can manage their water and wastewater treatment and collection system with instrumentation and control, iPads and cell phones. For me personally, I've seen sewer inspection techniques change over the last 45 years, it's been amazing. Reflecting back on a brick sewer job that I did for Metro King County uh, in the 1980s when we man or woman entered uh, 10.5 miles of large diameter brick sewers, we carried air monitors, oxygen tanks, we wore hip waders, we had headlamps, we wore waterproof steel toed boots. The safer, more remote ability to photograph and condition assess small diameter pipelines and large tunnels since the 80s has allowed better asset management of valuable infrastructure. The advantages and efficiencies in rehabilitation and repair uh, to underground utilities, the accuracy of mapping, the speed of reporting from a day of field work. Uh, and the higher productivity and safer inspection have just been amazing to me. Think back of the tools we used years ago just to get our work done. Today, there's no word processing department anymore. We enter text into our computers, our iPads, and we use software applications that streamline the documentation. We dictate to our phone, we convert our hand notes with mobile devices, and we can generate impressive communications on the fly. We can meet in person with or use virtual and Microsoft Teams apps. The sophistication of design tools, the ability to walk your client through a future home and look outside the window and see the view. I would never have imagined 3D printers and what they do today in my first office job after college when I was at the printer, never imagined. The efficiency of project management software, the ability to use community outreach tools and social media. We have come such a long way with technology about how we get our work done. And lastly, on the historic front, climate change is not new, but it's accelerating. Global change was a concept that was first put on the table at the United Nations Conference in 1972. That's 50 years ago in Stockholm, which forced, uh, focused on the human environment. The concept was coined global, change as researchers were investigating climate change and realizing that it was broader. It included components of the earth system, changes that were occurring to, because of human activities, goods and services supplied by the earth were affected, water, food, and clean air. Global change. The main driver of global change is the growing human population and limited resources. The past is one story, the future is a different one. We have been facing challenges of all kinds of stressors and adapting, but of late, not fast enough. The pace of change and the impact has increased. We as engineers, 
scientists, and technical people have provided solutions and answers to societal needs over the course of history, starting with the Romans and their water management approaches. Everyone in this room has a capacity uh, to really make an impact on the water industry and a sustainable world or you wouldn't be here. I wanna to turn to today. The pace of change is accelerating, but with more uncertainty. Our reality is one of finite resources, limited investment and climate that is rapidly changing. The way we have done things in the past will not serve us well in the future. Sustainability and resource recovery were not even words in our vocabulary a few decades ago. And now they are topics that are top of mind. The engineers before us applied sustainable thinking to design such as use of gravity flow, energy conservation, balancing earthwork during grading projects and locating structures out of low spots to keep them from flooding. Sustainability is defined in so many different ways. For me personally, sustainability is a quality of life without deteriorating the health and wellness of the environment that we live in. Resilience means that we can endure in the face of disruptive forces and mitigate undesirable consequences so that we can recover quickly. What do I think it'll be in the future? Sustainability must recognize that resources are finite and should be used wisely with long-term view and priorities that understand consequences and outcomes. Sustainability is about future generations and what we leave them. Our physical and social infrastructure systems need to be resilient so that they can adapt and return to functionality quickly after uh, they are impacted. Looking at the water and wastewater industry in particular, infrastructure is such an exciting topic now. I cannot remember in the last 40 years when there's been so much buzz about this topic. The recent Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act is a down payment on our future. More funding is needed from state, local, and private sectors, but it's a solid start. It builds on investments that have been made over the last 50 and 100 years um, and will address needs today that are long overdue. It'll create a framework for how we live now and set us up for the future. It will start to fix what is broken, but also moves us forward to a different, more sustainable way of life that is less impactful on the environment and will build a more resilient infrastructure. There will be focused investment in cleaner energy, broadband, and better transit for growing urban populations. Adding funding from the infrastructure bill to already existing pots of money from community ratepayers and industry investment, let's look closely at some water priorities. One of the primary reasons uh, that we are in this business is to protect public health and the environment. Water and wastewater treatment and distribution collection have been a focus for over 150 years, an incredible advancement in solving big problems that have allowed us to have a healthy and safer lifestyle. We're now focusing on solving advanced treatment of contaminants related to products and chemicals and drugs that we've introduced into our waste stream because of the way we live. A specific area I wanted to talk about was resource recovery. For example, our industry more recently, I think has focused in the last 25 years in the area of resource recovery, positioning us for a more sustainable way of life. Deliberate planning, design and construction equipment of equipment and facilities that use waste as an input and valuable products as an output is a key driver in our work, the work of all of us in this room. We've ventured into areas over the last 40 years, but it has become more an important focus for investment, research, technology development, and implementation, I would say in the last two decades. Specifically, communities and private industry are focused on protecting scarce water resources by recovering water from wastewater, generating energy, the production of biogas and fuel from wastewater solids, and making fertilizer from nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium found in human and industrial waste. Technology advances, production costs and efficiencies, 
have made these systems more available, more affordable, more scalable, and dependable for small industrial and larger applications. It's amazing to me how this area of resource recovery has become so visible in our daily lives, and with it, the expectations to live more sustainably. There are many more advances needed in this area and much more opportunity for innovation and investment. It is also so much more than our water sector. And I hope that society will continue to press for accountability with waste streams around products and material development, manufacturing, production of goods, and the way that we live life. So much more we need to do in order to be sustainable. Back to global change. The world has experienced the effects of global change, specifically impacting our water industry. Prolonged droughts, increased wildfires, extreme precipitation, extensive flooding, intense tropical cyclones, the loss of Arctic sea ice, snow cover, and permafrost. It is believed that these effects will increase if action is not taken to limit global warming. We are being called upon to develop a new paradigm for our engineering practice in a world in which the climate is changing, but the rate and extent of change and the subsequent impacts cannot be projected with a high degree of certainty. We are in uncharted territory and it calls for new thinking. So I have some ideas for you. Given the unpredictable nature of climate change, should we be designing our infrastructure for a shorter design life? rather than 20 or 50 years, like we have done in the past, should we design structures for temporary conditions so that they can be adjusted later to meet the new condition? We need to update our building standards and codes, consideration of the new reality, bring climate change information into the, nature's, into the nation's standard setting process and increase the pace for adaptation. There was a NOAA study that was done and published in February of 2022, setting sea level elevations around the world out to 2100. FEMA is now adopting and setting new design levels. These elevations should be used for design criteria for coastal communities now. Those design flood elevations are being set in the state of Maine this year. Implementing the use of new tools like FEMA has a free online program, it's called the National Risk Index to help community planners and stakeholders visualize natural disaster risk levels in counties across the United States. We need innovative technology to slow down warming trends. There's some pilot studies that are being done in Phoenix and in LA, uh, they have to do with pavement. There is a reflective pavement now that's been developed and it, uh, will halt uh, the sink, uh, heat sink radiating heat into neighborhoods. We need more technology development and products like these. They're called cool pavements. You heard it here. We need to understand their interdependence of infrastructure systems and how the sectors like transportation, energy, and water intersect. Systems need to understand the big picture as the solution that you may be making in one sector may impact another. We need to understand how putting modern technology into an existing infrastructure and what that impact of that technology can be on a legacy infrastructure. Are regulations nimble enough to uh, the changing environment and societal landscape? How can we make the most of the limited dollars and make compliance affordable? Not just driving toward outdated goals, or outcomes that don't make any sense today. We have an increased responsibility to address the risk and determine the solutions that will work and which ones don't make sense anymore. We have the responsibility to advise owners and work with regulators to collectively understand the range of scenarios and what it means to a system if some certain event happens. We need to be able to quantify the risk and put forth cost-effective resilient solutions. We need to be prepared to be surprised because there is so much uncertainty. So what can we do as water professionals? We need to apply our critical thinking abilities. We need to focus on broader system solutions. We need to improve our communication skills. We need to understand how these new tools and a look at a range of climate scenarios 
We need to better interpret the projections and what they mean relative to the infrastructure that we're building. Our skills in dealing with uncertainty must adapt and shift. To address these big systems, these global changes that are happening, we need as water professionals to be collaborative in spirit. We must be willing to partner with a wider community comprised of planners, architects, economists, emergency responders, insurance carriers, social equity experts. Single-minded solutions are not going to work to serve society. Our role is central to dealing with adaptation, mitigation, and big system solutions. When I think back over my career of some of the technical experts that I work with, and I respect them tremendously, they were not the best collaborators. They were more about the better idea. So I see today we need to put our diverse heads together. It needs to be holistic and collaborative effort. So we must start with your team, big, bring on the big thinkers, empower the group, visualize the future, plan for the worst, apply new thinking, incorporate science, research data available and develop with the latest tools. Factor in the cone of uncertainty. Remember the lessons from the past, but don't let them mire you down. Evaluate the risks, develop the scenarios, apply the selection and affordability criteria, communicate the options and the trade-offs, Seek public input, listen to promising ideas, modify as needed, move forward with buy-in and stay nimble. Our skills and experience as environmental professionals are in great demand, more so than I have ever seen in my career. We as engineers, scientists, and operators will need to work even more closely together to ensure that our infrastructure is safe, resilient, and sustainable. Government and the private sector are investing trillions of dollars each year into invest in infrastructure that may not withstand the impacts of the future. The events that we envision and those that we cannot see pose risks and severe economic cost. These impacts will also jeopardize our food, our water supply, and, our, and damage our ecosystems, resulting in the loss of biodiversity and affect our quality of life on a global scale. We need systems with adaptive capacity to ensure rapid return to functionality. Our infrastructure must be able to provide service when we need it. I'm going to share with you a personal story about global change and sustainability. Over a lifetime on my island in Casco Bay, it's called Shabig. You can look it up on your map apps. Uh, natural cycles have been altered. You can no longer catch mackerel in the numbers like I did with my grandfather 60 years ago. Clams are not found in the flats where you could fill a bucket in 30 minutes. Eel grass, dune grass is gone. Water temperatures are rising faster than most water bodies in the world. Jellyfish now abound and great white sharks are swimming in the waters. A few years ago, a woman was killed by a great white shark swimming in front of her cottage in the bay, which was shocking to us. I would catch sand sharks when I was young with my little hand drop, periwinkle at the end, and I never heard of a great white shark in Casco Bay. Along the entire coast of Maine, especially over the last 10 years, erosion has moved the sand, taken away beaches, flood tides, and making passages between islands and along driveways impossible many times throughout the year. On Shabig, a multi-million dollar pier renovation is badly needed to a hundred year old structure to make it higher five feet from those new data numbers that we're receiving, five feet higher. This is to serve a year round population of 300 people. And it's one of 12 remaining island communities on the entire coast of Maine. The community is also looking at expensive investments to mitigate erosion, protect property. At the same time, we need to address wastewater issues. All we have is septic tank drain fields and still cesspools. Those are failing. We need a wastewater collection system and treatment. There is great concern to protect the single aquifer for quality and quantity that we have. Recent testing showed that the school has PFAS in the water. It's a single aquifer that serves a summer population of 3,000 people. How will this small 
island meet the ever increasing demands of solid waste with the overflow of cardboard and packaging that comes with how we live our lives. There is no dump, there's no incinerator, but there's containers that haul island trash weekly via barge to Portland for disposal. There is now a single container just devoted to Amazon cardboard. Affordable housing for the island community is unavailable. The island school has a population of 11 students. Just a few years ago, it was 25. Young people go away to college. They do not return. The average age of the year-round population is closing in on 70. The year-round community is different than the one that my great-great-grandfather found in 1884, where there were farms, shipbuilding, lots of fish to harvest. Children went to one of three schools, took over their family business, raised their children on the island for over 200 years. It is drastically different and changing. What does the future hold the island and my daughter as we grapple with these challenges? Today, though, I remain hopeful. There is currently a planning study underway to rebuild that here with funding from the main DOT and the federal infrastructure bill. The island community was successful in receiving an $800,000 broadband grant from the state of Maine this spring as part of the federal infrastructure bill. The town of Shabiga is working closely with adjacent islands and the city of Portland to study, plan, and address sea level rise throughout Casco Bay. The town of Shabiga just received a grant from the state of Maine to do a resiliency study of the entire island. Property owners on Shabiga are stepping up to put parcels into land trusts to protect natural resources and wildlife. Growth management policies are being discussed and adopted to manage land development. Private and public nonprofits, I am head of one of them, are stepping up to fund studies and specific shoreline and coastal protection projects. There is a renewed commitment and a sense of urgency around education and management to protect dune grass, bird habitat, and shorelines that have been damaged due to voter overuse and public overuse. I am hopeful because of what I see these efforts and the commitment that I'm seeing on so many levels. It's just one example of, of the communities affected by global change and what they're doing. All of this, all of this comes down to us, the organizations that we work for. So I wanted to give you a few thoughts there. We play a critical role. Our companies that we work for and the organizations that we work for play a critical role. It starts with culture. It's exciting to see society and our professional community stepping up into the dialogue, addressing civil rights issues, equity and environmental justice. Workplace culture requires that we do not remain silent on these issues any longer. What we face today is complex and messy, but it is no longer acceptable to stay silent as we may have done in the past. Rising generations, our children, our times expect us to stand up to injustice. The culture of your organization matters. Culture attracts talent and retains talent. Talent, oh, finding talent and retention. Oh, I've spent a lot of time in my career and there's many of you here that I'm so excited to see who I've worked with. Um, I've spent so much time in finding and developing talent. My advice is to hire great people, invest in them and support them, groom them as the next generation leaders and get out of their way. You personally can advocate for all aspects of the water profession, be a champion, Share your enthusiasm, have fun, and inspire the next generation with what we do. We need it. Individually, oh, I have some advice for you for the long haul. Your life's journey molds you as a person, shapes you as a leader and a professional. 20 years ago, I attended a Harvard Advanced Management course. It was my biggest takeaway when I reflect back on it was build your life not just your resume. I came across a book recently, uh, it's called Love and Work by Marcus Buckingham. It talks about the importance of purpose, the work we do and who we work for. 
But he also talks about the need for personal satisfaction from the tasks that you do every day. I wanted to share some of those points as they really resonated with me. And I have my own suggestions for fulfillment from your work. Trust in your loves. What makes you happy? What, you may, what makes you feel in control? What brings you joy? What's unique to you? They will be your source of success and savior when things aren't going your way. The Mayo Clinic says spend 20% of your time at work with specific activities that you love and you are far less to experience burnout and you'll have a chance to do something you love each day, you're more likely to be highly resilient. Find the activities where you lose yourself in doing them, where the time flies by, brings you happiness, the activities that are positive, natural, energizing, life-giving, unique to you. Keep an eye out for those things. They click for you. They're easy to learn and master. Honor your instincts. Learn to read the signs of your own life. Your life should be an ongoing search for those threads. Don't be afraid of your fears. You can learn from them. Be curious and realize they're a part of you. They will help you understand what you really love. Don't stifle or deny those because they can eat away at you. Be generous with yourself. Do not wait until all the paths are cleared. Listen to your instincts. Trust your gut. Try new things. Take on that new opportunity. Start moving. Learn. Be curious. Most successful people that I know, they have three things that they do. They fulfill their sense of purpose and they believe in the why of their work. They collaborate well with their colleagues and teams and with people they trust and admire for the who. And their work days include the activities that they love and doing the what. Your sense of purpose, your own resiliency come from your own sense of control. Fits your strengths and makes you happy. Find those threads in your life and you'll build resilience for the long run. What has sustained me personally? Ah, a few lessons. I have worked for great companies, both large and small across the United States. I worked both in the public and private sectors. I grew up in the profession watching my father and my grandfather in civil engineering and surveying. I have worked for inspiring leaders great people managers with wonderful colleagues and with the best technical experts in the industry. I've had great clients, wonderful client relationships uh, and some of the most interesting projects of our time. I have come and gone from firms, not because I was unhappy, because I was offered opportunities that I thought I should try. Right out of engineering school, I was hired for a position with the city of Boulder as the first woman engineer from a pool of 70 men. I've been given great opportunities, uh, lots of support in my career from men and women, and I've worked in wonderful places around the country. I love the environmental profession. I'm grateful for what it's done, what it's added to my life. At the same time, I have experienced my disappointment, my frustration, and loss in my career. Life takes twists and turns along the way. You need to be resilient in your own path. Uh, I've been part of company transitions that were not my choice not considered for assignments I thought I was qualified for. I had to prove myself in the field, in the office, in the boardroom. I've also lost colleagues and wonderful partners for reasons both happy and sad. But I survived, I learned, I adjusted to the changes. I moved forward with the support of friends and family, realizing what was important in life. We all face challenges over the course of our lifetimes and the way you process those disappointments those passages that you make and are able to get back on your feet will build your own resiliency for the long haul. I say, ask for help if you need it. Be mindful of your physical, mental, and spiritual health. Take care of yourself along the way. For those of you that know me, I love to take walks. I also love the feeling of awe. awe. For me, it's a breathtaking view. It's a favorite vista. It's taking the expanse of a night sky, to walk in a special park with a friend or by yourself. You feel less weighted down, clears your head, can be some of your best creative thinking and problem solving. It's amazing what comes to your head when you have a clear head. Lifts up your spirits to a higher level. It correlates to happiness. So I say develop your skill of finding your awe. 
is a feed your soul, builds a happier and fulfilling life. It always has for me. So in closing, gosh, last week, Thursday, as I was preparing to fly west from Maine, I'm in Maine in the summer, I'm in Seattle in the winter, the New York Times headlines read, off the charts events at the top of the morning news summary. It described heat waves in the US, wildfires in Europe, floods in Asia. The summer has shown how climate has made extreme weather a part of everyday life all around the world. Senior research scientists were quoted as saying, these off the charts events are going to happen more often. Some of these events have no historical comparisons to 200 years, very much gonna get worse. Ooh. The article went on to say, does not mean that we're helpless. The writer suggested, had two suggestions, reduce greenhouse gases. And the second one was mitigate disasters through adaptation. Provided two examples, better forest management, could use that here in Washington, build infrastructure that is more resilient to heavy rainfall and flooding. This is our business. We are water professionals. What we do matters and the world needs us now, especially now. So I want you to have a great conference here in Spokane. I want you to enjoy the time together with your colleagues and industry friends. I hope you learn lots of new material that will feed your curiosity and prepares you to take on this new day. I have a challenge for the inflow group over here. So 37 years ago, I was here at Phoenix at WA. I wanna see you here at 37 years from now. When you leave here and head back home, that you depart with a renewed sense of purpose and responsibility to use your skills to make a difference for the generation to follow us. Thank you for having me. Glad to see all of you. Thank you so much, Phyllis, and go out and enjoy conference. <laughs>